for the great conference this week, but even for uh, using this photograph here of a somewhat younger version of Edward Witten. <laughs> So uh, as you heard in the first lecture this afternoon, in the 20th century, physicists developed a very powerful theory of the micro world based on quantum mechanics and a very uh, subtle elaboration of quantum mechanics that's known as quantum field theory. Its most complete version is the standard model of particle physics, which David Gross described to you in the first lecture. This theory is enormously powerful in describing atoms, molecules, and subatomic particles. The other great pillar of physics is general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity, in which gravitation results from the curvature of space and time. This theory governs stars, galaxies, and as you heard from Andre Linde, the universe as a whole. Einstein's conception of space and time is often illustrated with a picture that I've drawn here. In this picture, you imagine space as a rubber sheet. And here is a mass. That, the blue ball is a mass that you might think of as the sun. And in Einstein's theory, the sun causes a curvature of the space around it. Here we imagine that, that the sun, by its mass, presses down on the rubber sheet, which therefore is curved. The green ball perhaps represents one of the planets. What we see as curved orbits of the planets around the sun, according to Einstein, the, it's space itself that's curved, and the planet is merely traveling on the closest thing there is to a straight line in a curved space. So the large blue ball represents the sun, bending a rubber sheet, or in English we would say a trampoline, and the green ball is one of the planets. The curved orbits of the planets are really the straightest paths they can find in the curved space-time created by the sun. So that's Einstein's theory of gravity in a nutshell, without any equations. To Einstein, space-time is not known in advance, but evolves under the influence of the gravitational fields of the objects it contains. That was actually uh, the deepest departure that Einstein made from previous conceptions of physics. Previously, physicists had imagined space-time as simply something which was there, empty space, empty space-time, in which physics happens. But Einstein said that the unfolding of space-time itself is one of the most important things of what it means when physics is happening. Now, one of the great puzzles of modern physics is that quantum theory and gravity, as understood by Einstein, do not work well together. So in practice, physics of today is based on one theory, general relativity, for the big things, and another theory, quantum field theory, for the small things. That's not satisfactory, since the big things and the small things are part of the same universe, or maybe part of the same multiverse. <laughs> so there should be one theory that governs them, particularly because the big things are ultimately made out of small things. The sun, for example, is built out of many atoms and subatomic particles. So it doesn't make sense to have one theory that applies to an atom, and then another atom, and then a third atom. But when you get to a very, very large collection of atoms, you say, forget all that, and start over again with a different theory. Somehow, there should be one theory that describes both the little things and the big things that are ultimately made out of little things. Now, the basic problem in um, quantum theory of gravity is that Newton's force law, which you may have, uh, many of you will have encountered this equation in a high school class, and never mind if you haven't. But anyway, the point is that Newton says that the force between two masses separated by distance r becomes infinite when the distance becomes 0. Now, this didn't make any problem for Newton since, for instance, the distance between the moon and the Earth was never zero. So he studied the moon going around the Earth, and he didn't have to worry about what would happen if the distance was zero, because it never was. But if you try to apply gravitational theory to atoms and subatomic particles, you definitely do have trouble with the fact that the force law go becomes infinite when the distance goes to zero. 
you definitely have to worry about the possibility that two electrons collide with each other or with an electron collides with the atomic nucleus. Now, there actually was a version of the same problem early in the 20th century in the theory of electromagnetism, which, as David Gross also mentioned, is the basic force at work in most of what we see around us, atomic physics, biology, chemistry, and really most of the world that we see in everyday life. In this case, the force between two electric charges is given by an inverse square law that's a lot like Newton's law of gravity, except that instead of masses in the numerator, we have electric charges. But there's the same basic 1 over distance squared in the denominator. And as I said a moment ago, in atomic or molecular physics, we definitely do need to understand what happens when two electrons collide or an electron collides with an atomic nucleus. So physicists of 100 years ago had this problem, and it was solved by inventing quantum mechanics. But quantum mechanics did not solve it in an obvious way. What would be an example of an obvious solution? Well, for example, maybe the electron isn't the point particle, but is a little ball of charge. And then if you apply the, then uh, you would find out that the problem is less severe if the electron is a little ball of charge. The only trouble is that the cure is worse than the disease. You then face questions like what holds the ball of charge together, what describes its motion, and so on. Quantum mechanics involves a much more clever way of smearing out the electron by quantum uncertainty. So in classical physics, an electron is a point particle which at any moment has a definite position. So as time evolves, the electron has a trajectory in space-time. The blue curve tells you at each point in time where was the electron in space. At this time, it was here. At this time, it was there, and so on. And the electron travels on a definite curve in space and time. Quantum mechanically, that's not the case. You can't say exactly what was the path followed by the electron. It has an inherent fuzziness given by quantum mechanical uncertainty. There is a quantum uncertainty principle that, in practice, keeps you from having a problem when the two electrons collide with each other or with the atomic nucleus. Now, unfortunately, I can't draw a quantum electron or its path in spacetime. I can only really tell you what it isn't. A quantum electron does not follow a definite path in space-time, like a classical particle does. It's a blur where you can't, s you can say possibly, if you make the right observation, where it ended up, but you can't quite say how it got there. So quantum uncertainty solved the problem of the inverse square law for electromagnetism, roughly because quantum mechanically, you can never be sure whether the electron really did collide with the atomic nucleus. But it doesn't work for gravity. And unfortunately, it's hard to explain why it works for electricity and not for gravity. The best I can say is that the nonlinear mathematics that Einstein used in his theory of curved space-time does not agree well with the requirements of quantum theory. So this is a classic problem that was first seen in the 30s, 1930s of the last century. And it didn't go away afterwards when much progress was made in other areas of physics. It only became clearer that it was difficult to reconcile gravity with quantum mechanics. And in my opinion, there's only been one significant idea about this problem. And that's string theory, in which to put things most naively, a point particle is replaced by a little loop of vibrating string. So this dot is meant to symbolize a point particle. And then I've replaced over here the point particle by a little loop of string. But there's something a little misleading about such a picture, which is that you have to add quantum uncertainty on both sides. 
The only trouble is that I've got no idea how to draw quantum uncertainty. So I didn't. Just in your mind's eye, you have to imagine that everything is fuzzy in a way that we can't see with our classical minds. So the electron is fuzzy and the string is fuzzy, quantum mechanically. So here's the trajectory of a string in spacetime. At some given time, for example here, we had a loop of string that was over here. Later on, the loop of string was here, and still later it was here. And as it evolves in time, the string fills out a little tube in spacetime. To be more exact, that's a classical picture of the orbit of a string in spacetime. The quantum picture is a fuzzy picture, sorry, a fuzzy version of the classical picture, which unfortunately we can't draw. Let's compare with the point particle. So this is the picture I gave before. At each moment in time, the particle is somewhere. And as time goes on, it, the particle traces out a curve in spacetime. For the string, at each moment in time, you have a little loop of string. And as time goes on, the loop fills out a tube in spacetime. So both the curve and the tube should really be made fuzzy by quantum uncertainty. But all I can say there is go on and study quantum mechanics at the university, and you too will have trouble drawing it, just like I do. Now, one immediate problem, I say, one immediate consequence of replacing a point particle by a string is that a string can have many different shapes, of which I've drawn a few. And roughly speaking, if string theory is correct, the different shapes correspond to the different elementary particles that you heard about in David Gross's lecture. The electron, the muon, the photon, the up quark, the neutrino, the graviton, and all the rest. Well, that's again a kind of classical description. Well, okay. I'll correct it quantum mechanically in a moment. But first, I'll simply say, but if string theory is correct, sorry, if string theory is anything, it's a unified theory of all kinds of things, because the many different possible shapes of a string represent different possible particles. And so the string, if it's anything, gives a unified description of many different things, maybe even a unified description of everything. That's somewhat analogous to the fact that an ordinary string, for example, a string in a violin or a piano, has many different modes or shapes of vibration corresponding to a fundamental tone and the higher harmonics or overtones. You can make a fundamental tone with what musicians call a tuning fork. The only trouble is that it sounds really harsh to the human ear. The beauty of music comes from the subtle interplay of the harmonics, where, remember, the harmonics correspond to the different shapes with which one string, a piano string or a violin string, can vibrate. In string theory, the higher harmonics lead to the multiplicity of the elementary particles. As usual, the picture is a little more subtle quantum mechanically. A more accurate statement is not that a particular elementary particle, like the photon, corresponds to a particular shape of the string. Rather, it corresponds to a particular quantum mechanical wave function in the space of all possible shapes. So that's a mouthful. And uh, again, if you're interested in what it really meant, you'll have to go on in the university and actually study quantum mechanics. And then you, too, will be able to tell people about wave functions in the spaces of all possible shapes. Now I come to a fundamental difference between string theory and the established framework of quantum field theory as it was developed in the 20th century. In quantum field theory, one just assumes what the most elementary particles are going to be and proceeds from there with some further assumptions to calculate how the particles are going to behave.
For example, you might want to describe electricity. Well, the basic, you might want to describe atoms, which basically are made out of electric fields and charged particles. So that would, the, the right theory would be quantum electrodynamics, which is an important part of the standard model that David Gross talked about. So if you want to develop the theory of quantum electrodynamics, you build a theory of electrons and photons. String theory is a little different. You can't just decide what the particles are going to be. You can't just assume what the particles are going to be. You have to find out what the particles are by calculating, by quantizing the motion of a relativistic string. When this was done in the early 70s, a surprise popped out. One of the elementary particles described by the string is the graviton, a quantum unit of Einstein's gravitational field. The physicists who did these early calculations were not trying to describe gravity. They had another problem in mind, which actually David Gross briefly explained in the first lecture. It had to do with the nuclear force. And the graviton did not fit their preconceptions. So dozens of papers were written with the goal of not predicting quantum gravity. But this attempt was not successful. Attempts to tinker with the quantization of the relativistic string so as to not predict the graviton were not successful. Physicists working on the theory had to accept that if it's anything, string theory is a theory of elementary particles interacting via quantum gravity along with other forces. Not for the last time, the string had a mind of its own, and physicists working on string theory had to follow it the way it wanted to go. Another example came when string theory forced physicists to incorporate extra dimensions of space-time. No one wanted them at the time and the person who made the first discovery, Claude Lovelace, who spent most of his career at Rutgers University in New Jersey in the United States, was greatly ridiculed to the point that he buried his discovery in a footnote. But in hindsight, extra dimensions are a blessing in disguise because they give more room to get the complexity of elementary particles as different vibrational states of a single string. Now, to, to probe more deeply into this, I should tell you about something called Feynman diagrams. Richard Feynman was the famous physicist who spent most of his career at Caltech in the United States, perhaps the most famous physicist of the second half of the 20th century. And his single greatest discovery was Feynman diagrams, which I'm about to tell you about. Feynman described the interactions of elementary particles in terms of space-time histories of particles coming in from the past, splitting and joining, and going out to the future. So I've made a very schematic drawing in which time runs vertically and space runs horizontally. And a line represents the path of a particle through space and time. Remember, we talked about that before, that classically a particle would have a, a definite path in space time. The difference from what I said before is that now, according to Feynman, we allow branching and joining events where one particle comes in and splits into two, or two particles recombine into one. I've drawn this picture as if the particles are classical particles on definite paths, because as always, I can't draw quantum uncertainty. But quantum mechanically, you're supposed to sum or integrate over all the details of the picture. 
the particle trajectories, which become fuzzy, as they always do in quantum mechanics, and crucially, the space-time events, x, y, z, and w, at which what we call interaction events occur. An interaction event is a moment, x, y, z, or w, in space-time, at which one particle splits into two, or two recombine into one. So this is a kind of classical picture of a Feynman diagram, which is the kind of picture you'll us usually see drawn, because it's the kind of picture that can be drawn. But in your mind's eye, you just have to imagine that it's all completely quantum mechanical, all fuzzy. The interaction events are very important. It's because of the interaction events that something happens. When one formulates a quantum field theory, such as the standard model, one of the key steps is to explain what interaction events are allowed and with what probability amplitudes. That's a technical quantum mechanical phrase that I won't try to explain today. Crudely speaking, you have to say what is allowed to happen and at what rate it can happen. For example, can one particle, such as an electron, split into two particles? And if so, which two particles is the electron allowed to split into? Can one particle split into three? So when you invent a quantum field theory, you say what particles you want to study, but you also say what interaction events are going to be allowed, and at what rates, or technically what amplitudes, they happen. The troubles of quantum field theory were electricity works and gravity does not, have to do with what happens when the interaction events, x, y, z, and w, all coincide in space-time. Perhaps the biggest difference from the standard quantum field theory framework of physics to string theory is that in string theory, the interaction events disappear. So I've drawn again a Feynman diagram on the left. And now I've drawn a stringy version of the Feynman diagram on the right. So let me explain what is happening. You see, as I told you some time ago, a particle ha traces out a curve in space, but a string traces out a tube in space. When a particle splits into two particles, that occurs at an event, which I've here labeled z, where one breaks into two. But a string can split into two strings in a completely smooth way without your being able to look at it and say exactly when that happens, or exactly when and where that happens. The single most important difference between standard physics and string theory is the following. From a distance, the picture on the right looks a lot like the picture on the left. But up close, there's a crucial difference. There are no special points, no interaction events. Now, since this is such a crucial point, I want to take a close-up view of just one interaction event. So here, I'm showing one particle that comes in and breaks into two, and there's a definite moment in space-time where it happens. Here's the stringy picture. One string comes in, represented by a tube that describes its motion in space-time. And two tubes go out. But there isn't a distinguished moment where something happens. Technically, this picture has what you might call a singularity at the vertex, at the point I'm uh, singling out with the green dot. And this picture is completely smooth. There's a question that you might sometimes ask, that some people sometimes have asked me. Is there not a last time in this picture on the right where there was one string and not two? And that's a very good question, testing our knowledge of relativity. Because Einstein taught us that what is time depends on the observer. So one observer might think that the horizontal lines have definite time, and that this is the moment of last time with only one string. But another observer thinks that the lines of constant time 
or at an angle. And then a different moment would be the last moment with only one string and not two. So Einstein would teach us that in this picture on the right, because it's completely smooth, there is no distinguished event anywhere. So th th this, to summarize what I've said, on the left there is a distinguished moment at which one particle splits into two. On the right there is no such distinguished moment. This has got many consequences, much more than I can possibly tell you about today. So to begin with, the string decides what its interactions will be. In pre-string physics, a physicist constructing a theory decides what elementary particles to assume, for instance, electrons and photons, and then decides what interactions are desired. For example, the basic electromagnetic interaction. I previously explained that in string theory, we can't just assume the particles we want. We have to find out what they are by quantizing the motion of the string. But actually, because any small piece of the string picture is the same as any other, the string decides what the interactions are going to be, just as it decides what are the elementary particles. Let's take another look at this picture, which you're beginning to understand is my favorite picture, to understand it more fully. On the left, a physicist who is selecting a particular quantum field theory can invent the rules for what happens at the branching point. So for example, can the particle coming in be an electron? And can the particle going out be a photon or a muon or what? So when you're inventing the quantum field theory, you say, which particles are allowed to participate in this process? That's part of what leads to the diversity of quantum field theories. On the right, there's no branching point and no option to introduce special rules. Since the string decides on its own interactions, it can and does force upon us a quantum theory that describes, among other things, gravity. Because there are no interaction events, the usual problems of quantum gravity do not arise. The usual problems arise when the different interaction events, which in my picture were x, y, z, and w, all coincide in spacetime. There's no such question in string theory because there aren't any special interaction events. Now, as I explained near the beginning of the talk, Einstein's theory of gravity involves a fundamentally new concept of space and time in which fundamentally a mass bends the space time around it. One would think that a theory that improves on Einstein's theory so as to reconcile it with quantum mechanics would somehow once again change our understanding of space time. The absence of an interaction point seems to be part of this. In standard quantum field theory, the interaction point is the prototype of a definite space-time event where something happens. In string theory, there's no such thing 
And that seems to be a, uh, a hint of the fact that in string theory there's no such thing as a no such notion as a definite space-time event. I told you at the, some time ago that in passing to quantum mechanics, the trajectory of a particle becomes fuzzy. And apparently, in passing to string theory, our concepts of space-time similarly become fuzzy. So we haven't gotten to the bottom of it, but it seems that our traditional concepts of space-time become fuzzy, a little like what happens to the concept of classical physics in the context of quantum mechanics. String theorists have performed many fascinating calculations, exhibiting this fuzziness under different conditions, but we are far from a full understanding. And the rate of progress is uh, sufficiently slow that I suspect that even the younger students here today will have the opportunity to, partic to participate in understanding this if you choose to go in that direction with your studies. There's one less cosmic but still very significant aspect to the stringy nature of space-time. That's supersymmetry, which is a kind of quantum dimension of space-time that's needed to make string theory work. Uh, David Gross told you a little bit about it at the end of his talk. There's a chance it's within reach experimentally, as you've heard from David. And physicists have certainly searched for supersymmetry in accelerator experiments, and not only in accelerator experiments, also in other types of experiment. Now, Another important consequence of the absence of an interaction event is that string theories are much more constrained than quantum field theories. There are infinitely many possible quantum field theories differing by what particles and interactions are assumed. The inventors of the standard model drew on clues from experiment to find the right one. By contrast, there are very few string theories. In the mid-80s, it seemed there were five possible string theories. There were two type two superstring theories in which the string is a closed loop that's oriented and has a distinguished direction, which I draw by this arrow and it's insulating. It doesn't conduct electricity. There were also two heterotic string theories in which the string is still closed and oriented, so the picture is the same, but now the string is superconducting. And finally, there was one more string theory, which was the so-called type 1 string theory, that describes open and closed, unoriented and insulating strings. So here's a closed loop, but without an arrow. And here's an open, a piece of open string. And the open string has electric charges at its end, somewhat similar to quarks. In fact, in a sense, this analogy is how string theory was discovered, as David mentioned. But we learned in the 1990s that the five string theories is not quite the whole answer. There are five different string theories if one can assume that the quantum effects are small. But if the quantum effects are not assumed small, it turns out that the different string theories are not really different. To draw a good picture requires at least two dimensions where one dimension measures how important is quantum mechanics, and the other dimension measures how important is the stringiness. 
So a schematic picture, it's only a schematic picture, is this one. In this picture, I draw a kind of two-dimensional version of reality, and the five traditional string theories are five different limits in which, in, this, in different senses, quantum effects become small. And when you make this picture, one also discovers a new limit that was not one of the traditional string theories, but was something else, 11-dimensional supergravity. So the five different string theories and one wild card turned out in the 90s to be different limiting cases of just one theory. This theory is our candidate for describing quantum gravity and for superunification of the laws of nature. Now, although there is only one um, candidate for superunification of the laws of nature, when you try to solve the equations, it has, they do, as far as we can understand, have the kind of richness that Andre Linde was talking about. So water in everyday experience can be in the three forms that he described, which are um, steam, ordinary water, the liquid, and ice. And because of the extra dimensions and certain other subtleties of string theory, String theory can be in not three forms, but as far as we understand, many, many forms. So although I think it's still quite speculative whether this is the right interpretation, one interpretation of the picture has been that there's one theory, which is the candidate for superunification, and this one theory has the properties that enable it to generate the fantastic multiverse that Andre Linde talked about in the last talk. However, I would like to conclude this talk by giving you a sense of another very important aspect of this subject. In the last few centuries, we've learned that when some facet of nature is within reach of detailed observation or experimental study, we can learn a lot about it and eventually understand it. whether it's the early universe, the quantum theory of the atom, the workings of living things, our knowledge has grown on numerous fronts far beyond what seemed conceivable just a few generations ago. There are all kinds of examples of this, but perhaps the most amazing recent example is what you were hearing about from Andre Linde where he showed observations made in the last couple of decades that give an incredibly detailed understanding of the early universe. However, quantum gravity is a jump far beyond what is accessible experimentally in any obvious way. For example, the energies at which we think the workings of quantum gravity would become clear exceed the energies we can actually reach, even in our most advanced laboratories, by a huge, huge factor, a factor that exceeds the ratio in size of a human being to an individual atomic nucleus. It's a factor that's not as big as some of those numbers that Linde had. But it's, second, it's the second, more or less the second biggest number in, in science. Because of this, many physicists think it's not worthwhile even to think about quantum gravity. And while I don't really agree, I think that personally I never would have tried to work on it had not a promising avenue appeared in the form of string theory. You might philosophically believe it's not worthwhile to work on quantum gravity, but if a quantum theory is discovered that incorporates the essential properties of known physics and forces quantum gravity upon you, it's a little bit unpragmatic to ignore that. 
But if string theory hadn't appeared by accident, I doubt that I personally would have gone off looking for anything like that. Because I think it would have seemed too far away. So I actually regard it as an incredible privilege and piece of good fortune that we do have the opportunity to work on this fantastic theory. While many of the things one would want to do to study quantum gravity are hopelessly out of reach, there are ways we may be able to get more information from experiment. I've already mentioned the search for supersymmetry, which is one of the important ideas in string theory. This might be found at high but accessible energies. And moreover, there are fascinating examples where nature has let us see phenomena that seem to come from energies that are ordinarily out of reach. The two famous examples that have come to fruition already involve the cosmic microwave fluctuations, which you heard about from Linde, and the neutrino masses that we haven't really been telling you about today. And the literature is filled with proposals for new possibilities. Proton decay, cosmic strings, magnetic monopoles, new phenomena in the cosmic microwave radiation, and so on. I can't foretell which of those will pan out in the coming decades, but uh, you see, 40 years ago, one would not have been able to foretell that these two would pan out. So life is full of uncertainties, and very often in the past, things that you couldn't imagine being able to do turned out to be doable. The acceleration of the expansion of the universe may also be a fundamental clue. Andre Linde told you about how he and some others have interpreted it. Will the clues we can get be enough? Who knows? Life is full of uncertainty. And that's not only when you're trying to do theoretical physics. It depends on how lucky and clever we are but it doesn't only depend on us. It depends partly on what the nature of the answer is, by which I mean, although this is too technical to explain properly now, how in detail string theory is manifested in the real world. In the meantime, I personally think that string theory has proved its worth by the new insights it's offered us on established theories in physics and even in mathematics, with much more probably to come. And that too many nice things have happened to be a giant coincidence. So al although the reasons are mostly circumstantial, I personally believe that this effort is most probably on the right track. At any rate, it's our chance to get beyond the framework in which we currently understand the laws of nature. Thank you.